Our hymn of celebration this morning is hymn number 733. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing.
remain standing as we unite in the historic confession of our Christian church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'd like to invite at this time Sean and, and Whitney O'Hara up with their daughter Anna Pease. Y'all can come right on up here. They're here to, uh, well, she was almost asleep and then we just messed it up, didn't we? Uh, <laughs> but here for, uh, to make covenants with God uh, with their baby. And we do that inside of a community of faith, so you have a part to play in this as well. Uh, but Sean and Whitney, I ask you on behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, answer, I do. And do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, answer, I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, answer, I do. And will you nurture Anna and Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, answer, I will. What name is given to this child? Okay, you ready? So we were somewhat practicing earlier. <laughs> And not that she was a little bit worried, but she did not have the same look to me like she did towards her dad. That, but maybe it'll be okay. So they do this. They, they come with making covenants to God, which you just heard, but you make covenants as well on behalf. Uh, do you renew your faith in God, place your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, and place your whole trust in his grace for salvation? If so, answer, we do. And will you nurture Anna in faith by loving and caring for her? And will you do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and, for, and perfect her in love? If so, answer, we will. If you would, go ahead and take your hymn books and just go ahead and turn to 191. We'll sing this in just a moment. And a peace, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May God's grace and mercy rest upon you all the days of your life. Amen. Yeah, I got a smile. So, uh, if you would sing with me hymn number 191.
we ask is that you would be with us as we seek to live in a way that shines light, uh, your light, uh, particularly in the direction of Anna. Bless their family, we pray. Now in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You may be seated. Let us prepare our hearts for prayer. The psalmist tells us, O oh God, that it's an invitation that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Lord, we come today to remind ourselves that you, O oh God, are the one, is the one who invites us to lay that which is heavy upon our hearts, that which clouds and sh casts a shadow on our ability to see tomorrow. You invite us, God, to lay those at the cross. For God, we know that if we continue to carry those, our doubts, our fears, our anxieties, even our power, our prestige, and our possessions, it will be difficult if we carry those. It will be difficult to give praise to you. And so, O oh God, let us lay down those things. Maybe even put them into a box, set them under the pew, so that God, you, and your spirit will speak to us that solemn message of good news. It's, God, it's not that, oh God, we're not concerned. It's not that, oh God, that uh, we uh, are supposed to come and check our rational minds at the door. It is to come knowing and confessing that without you, we will fail. Without you, we will be burdened. Without you, we will continue to orchestrate the outcomes. And so, God, may we rest at the foot of the cross, at the entrance of the empty tomb. And may that, O oh God, speak into those who are mourning, those who are struggling, those who are thinking about their regrets of the past or the unknowns of tomorrow, may that speak that good news message where you say, I have you in the palm of my hand. You are invited, O oh God, to this place. And we'll give you honor and glory as we remember that prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is hymn number 451. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing.
be seated. Let us now worship God with his tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Gracious God, receive these, your tithes and our offerings. Allow them to be multiplied in this church so that we may be able to further your kingdom and hasten your return. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. standing as we read our scripture passage from the letter to the Philippines, the Philippians, the Philippines, the Philippians, yes, right after the book of Hezekiah, Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, I'll get that right, brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us, for many live as enemies of the cross of Christ, I have often told you of them, and now I tell you, even with tears, their end is destruction, their God is the belly, their glories is in their shame, their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. 
Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. We welcome you. Uh, Members and visitors, we're glad that you are here with us. There's a red pew pad. If you wouldn't mind uh, registering your attendance, passing it down from the center to the end and back again, learning the names of those who are worshiping around you. And as you greet one another, I invite the children to come forward for our children's message. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Do that. Do you want to hold that? I'll let you hold it just a second. Come on, boys. Come on up here. John. John. Come on up here. Hey, Will. How are you doing? Pretty good. Well, good morning, guys. How y'all doing? Well, today, I don't know if you know this or not, today is what we call Trinity Sunday. I'm sure you knew that, right? You didn't know that? What do do we mean when we say Trinity? Do we know? No. Does anybody know? You know? You don't know? Does anybody know, know what Trinity means? Trinity is a way that we describe God. And there was a guy one time named uh, St. Patrick, and he had a clover, sort of like this, and he said the best way to understand God and this idea of what we call Trinity is how many leaves are there? Three. Three. Right. And so we say that that's right. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, right? And so, well, there, well, God is, that's a good question, Meg. We won't say that for next week. How about that? So, uh, uh, um, what we do is we say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and that's three individual leaves, but it's all part of one big clover, right? Yeah. And so even though we say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, it's all part of... God. Right, God. And so when we say Trinity, we talk about three, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, oh, yeah. That's right, it does, doesn't it? Somebody's been paying attention in school, right? All right, fantastic. So, uh, so today's Trinity Sunday, and what we celebrate is what we call this three. And that's why um, a, um, a clover gives you good luck. Well, maybe, I tell you, it might be good luck. I, I like to have clovers, that's for, that's for sure. Do you have clovers? Do you have any clovers? I found one. You found one, well, hold on to it, you know. Could. I found a four-leaf clover. You found a four-leaf clover. I well, I only have a three-leaf <laughs> On your birthday, well, that's almost like having a rabbit's foot, right, and a horseshoe. Well, <laughs> all right. Today, <laughs> do you know that John said the Philippines and not Philippians? <laughs> so today is Trinity Sunday, and one of the great things that we celebrate about Trinity Sunday is this God that is three in one. Okay, can you do that? We're going to do that by praying, all right? All right, so let's, let's close our eyes. And, oh, God, what we do is we give thanks to you. We give thanks that you are uh, your creator, and you are a redeemer, and you're a sustainer. And the way we talk about this God as being Trinity, three in one. And so for that, we are grateful. And we ask, O oh Lord, your blessings upon those who sit with me, watch over them, O oh God, keep them safe, help them to grow in every way possible. Help them to grow physically. We want them to grow emotionally, mentally, relationally. We also want them to grow in you, to know that their identity is anchored in you. And for that, we give thanks, O God. Bless these, we pray, in the name of Christ. Amen. Next week, I promise.
Thank you, choir. I want to give you an update on our worship uh, schedule. Uh, many of you know that the first Sunday of each month we take communion and we celebrate that as part of our worship service. Uh, next week is we'll, we'll share in the sacrament of communion, not the first Sunday in June. Uh, the, the reason for the change is that uh, many of you remember Mark Magoni, and Mark Magoni has been a part of St. Paul in, in various ways, uh, probably longer than he can remember. And uh, Mark will be preaching all three services on June the 5th, which is the first Sunday uh, of the month of June, and uh, so, so that he can share uh, about what's going on in his life and about the Methodist Children's Home. We're going to celebrate communion uh, just one week uh, earlier. So I uh, hope that you'll put that at least in your minds on uh, your calendar, and, uh, and we'll operate that just for the next two Sundays. Let's pray. Oh God, what we hope and pray is that in this same spirit of worship, uh, that in the hearing of a text, that your spirit will lead in and weave into the reading of a text and hearing of a text uh, so that it becomes gospel. And we hope for that, we pray for that, we pray for that every time that we read scripture in a service. Uh, we want to be formed and transformed by that, oh God, we pray. So we give you our minds and we give you our hearts in this time and we give it to you in the name of Christ. Amen. <clears throat> There's a guy in the third century named Alban and Alban lived in uh, what was called the Roman empires, uh, the part of, of Britain that the, the Roman Empire occupied. He, he was a soldier there and for the most part that's all we know or we don't know his early life. We just know that he was a soldier in this Roman uh, occupied portion of Britain. We know that he was a, a, a pretty good citizen. He would have been a citizen to be a soldier. Uh, but we know, even though we don't know much about his life, we know a little bit about his life from the day that he met this priest. He's minding his own business, and then one day there's this priest that is, uh, is fleeing some, some pursuers, and he beats an, on Alban's door and Alban opens up the door. He, he, Alban's not a Christian. He doesn't know anything about this priest, but he welcomes him in. And really under just sort of a wait and see uh, attitude. He, uh, he doesn't know much about the priest, but he, he welcomes him in and he, he sort of cares for the priest for about three or four days just observing the priest. But he is uh, overwhelmed by the, the priest's his piety, how he lives his life, how he goes about his life, how, how caring he is towards Alban. And it ends up after about three or four days of, of Alban observing the priest that he, he asks the priest to baptize him into the faith. And so that's what the priest does. But Alban knows that the, the pursuers are close to, uh, to the village and they're going to be doing door checks and house checks and and so he, he comes up with a plan. He hatches his plan in order to help the priest. They change clothes, and, and he's going to send the priest out the back door when he goes out the front door, now dressed as the priest, and, and that's exactly what happens. He, he, he walks out of his front door. He discloses himself as the priest to the pursuers, and they arrest him. And so they take him before the local magistrate, the local judge, and, and it's not long into the conversation that the judge understands this really not the priest. But... The judge is irate. And so he looks at Alban and says, well, since you've, you've chosen to conceal uh, your real identity, your true identity by imposing to be the priest, well, you need to know that I, you now will receive the same torture and punishment. And so that's what happens. He's tortured for a number of days, given an opportunity to recant now this new faith in Christ. If not, he'll be beheaded. He does not recant, and he is beheaded. But in the last few days of his life, he, he conducted himself in such a way that, that his executioner and many of the persons who were, were watching this whole ordeal take place are moved by his sacrificial love. And after his death, they too become Christians. I think if Alban and Paul, the writer of the text this morning, lived in the same time, they would have been best of friends. Both of them operated with a sense of that one life 
actually can have a powerful influence over another. If you know anything about the New Testament, you know that Paul in, in the Philippians, I'm going to get a lot of mileage out of that. I just want you to know. I told John, it's, one, it's so wonderful that we don't keep bloopers in the church. Uh, because uh, John, not so much, but I make them all the time, and, and I would hate to see the blooper reel uh, when it comes to preaching or reading or teaching. Uh, but Paul and the Philippians had a deep, close, intimate relationship with each other. Of all the churches that Paul was a part of in the first century, he was closest to the Philippians. They supported him. He supported them. And what's interesting about this text is at the end of chapter 3, he says something, that, well, I really don't know what to make of. He says, join in imitating me. Now, on some level, it, would, it seems a bit odd. We would think from the Bible, we would hear imitate Christ. I mean, that's what we believe, that Christ is the, you know, Christ is our Savior, Christ is our Lord, Christ is our example. And so it would make sense for Paul and anybody else to say, well, just imitate Christ. We're going to be in the background. Christ is going to be up front, and, and you just imitate Christ, and things are going to be okay. He says, imitate me, talking about himself. That almost sounds heretical, doesn't it? Now, just to redeem Paul, you need to know something about the first century. Long before Paul and even long after Paul, there, there was a style of teaching, a style of life, a style of leadership where one person would, would sit and, and follow and watch and observe, sort of like an apprentice, for a period of time. They, they were called disciples. Jesus had disciples. We're very aware of that. He, he's not the only people that had disciples in that day. That's not a bad thing. Disciple only means, what it literally means is learner, student, pupil. And the idea is that you would sit under someone who, who, who either knew more or who had walked that path before you, and you would observe for a period of time to learn what it would be, either to learn uh, spiritual formation, to learn witness, to, make, to be instructed. And so this idea of saying, imitating me, even though there's part of us in our day and time that gets a little uneasy whenever we hear that, he was in step with all the other teachers or examples. Then here's time. And the idea was that the Philippians could imitate or follow Paul because Paul was imitating or following Jesus. And if they're following Paul and Paul's following Jesus, then naturally they're also going to be following Jesus because Paul followed Jesus. That's the flow. That's the concept. I think today this style of living, of imitation, needs to be recaptured. Join in imitating me. Could you say that to someone? Let me tell you reasons why you won't recapture this style of life. First has to do with just history. Now, we don't have to go through the whole history of, of the church or, or history of different uh, religions. I mean, we, we, we are, just in our, our, our recent history, we are aware of how this has ended up poorly for people. If you think back, depending on your age, Jim Jones and the People's Temple, David Koresh and the Branch Davidians, Marshall Applewhite and the Heaven's Gate, Joseph D. Mombro and Doomsday Cult, those are just ones within the last 40 years, maybe 50 years or so, where someone has said, here, come imitating me, and it ended up in destruction. So there's a natural pushing back against this concept that says, well, I don't want anybody to imitate me. And I'm surely not going to do that because I've witnessed in my life what it looks like when people do that. It could end poorly. And so there's some of us, whenever we hear this idea of we're comfortable, I mean, we're good Protestants, we're comfortable with imitating Christ, but the idea of in, uh, imitating someone else who's, who's following Christ, well, I don't know about this, Shane. This doesn't feel right. And I've witnessed a, a number of times where it ended poorly. And so some of us today will just dismiss the teaching. 
it's not our history. They're for, for personal reasons. And the idea is that if, uh, if leading and guiding and helping, uh, you know, if, if, we're, if we're doing that for someone else, well, we're, we're painfully aware of our own flaws. No one has to point them out. We know them. And so the idea that says I'm to be the example for someone else when I, when I know that I'm not perfect, no thank you. Maybe fear. I'm flawed. I, I think I'll just disqualify myself because I'm not the right example for someone to imitate. And so some of us will just dismiss it because we really don't think that applies to us. After all, that's for someone else who's further down the line than me. Maybe another reason would be, uh, frankly, we just don't want the responsibility. I mean, the idea that uh, I would be responsible or you would be responsible for someone else, I mean, you know, even if we're well-intended, what, what if we make a mistake? What if we get it wrong and that it ends up leading someone astray? I don't know how much you know about the New Testament, but Jesus does not have kind words for people who become stumbling blocks. Do you know that passage? Something about a millstone, very large, very large stone tied around the neck, dropped in the water. That doesn't sound inviting, right? And so the idea when it comes to the responsibility for someone else, no thank you. Even if I want to do good and if I'm well intended, if it, you know, if it, if it turns up south, then I might be responsible for another person, another life. So for these reasons, and maybe one or two more, we'll dismiss this idea of imitation. That's unfortunate. Let me tell you why. Let me give you reasons why now to embrace what Paul is doing. And the first one is, uh, and you've heard this before, what if you really are the only Jesus they see? You know, if you're following Christ and they're following you, or at least imitating what you're doing, then would they not also be following Christ as well? See, and we live in a biblical, illiterate society. We live in a biblical, illiterate church. The, the latest statistics uh, say that uh, y'all are churchgoers, you're in the church, so you qualify for this, that you probably have at least seven Bibles in your house, maybe more. And when is the last time you read it? 79% of Americans, even larger than the church, but not every American is in the church, 79% of Americans, citizens of this country, in the last poll taken about two years ago, still see the Bible as good for living, as instructive, as helpful, as, as an asset for someone, 79% inside of our country. Now, 80% of churchgoers, not, our, not, not sit, just people who are in church, 80% don't read their Bible daily. To make it worse, it has been proven over and over and over again that Bible study is still the number one principal element to growing somebody's faith. Now, worship's important. Prayer is important, sir. All those things are important. But the number one has to do with the Bible. Eight out of ten. Now, the good news is that y'all were part of the two and the seven or uh, eight other churches that you'll pass on the way home. That's the ones we're talking about. So don't. Eight out of ten. And so the idea that says, well, I'll just show them the Bible and they can see Jesus and that'll be enough, they're not reading it. We're not reading it. 
So maybe you might be for a season in their life the only Jesus they'll see. For that reason alone, why not say it might not be perfect, but at least follow with me because I'm following Christ. Another reason, if, you, if we are responsible, and if you do have influence over another, if, imitate me to take on what Paul says. Where you say that to someone else, that really will force you to pay attention to your faith. And to say it the way my children would, that'll make you step up your game. At least when it comes to God. You know, all of us, if you've been baptized, part of what one of the tenets of baptism is you are commissioned out into ministry. Priesthood of believers, I mean, ambassadors for Christ, those are some of the, the, the New Testament analogies to that. The idea is that we're sent out, we're commissioned to go and to be ministers in the world. When I think about that for me, there are just some things that I don't do, not because I can't do them, I can do them. We just choose not to do them because it might provide a negative influence. You don't lose anything. My life, giving up something sacrificially, you don't lose. You just choose not to do it because there's something else that's more important and that is you want to be that influence in the life of another. We just take a higher road. We don't lose. But when it comes to being, being a model, a person of influence in the life of someone else, we are responsible. And in being responsible, we do have to pay attention to our faith. Let me tell you another reason, and this to me is the real, the, the real important one. People really are longing and looking for help. I, I call this the incarnation principle. They want to see somebody's faith in the flesh have meat on the bones to see it uh, that's what incar incarnation means I mean, to, to see someone they desperately want to see someone navigate our materialistic society ruled by greed by pleasure and by selfishness in the text Paul says that be careful because there are people who their God is their belly and it's talk about just the appetite for more. And that's true, still true today. And so the, 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 the countercultural one that says, no, let me show you a different way. People want to, to see models of, of fulfilled marriages. They want to see models of, of, of parenting. They want to see someone model what it's like to balance their faith and to balance their work, to balance their faith and to balance their body, how to see that, how to act with that. They desperately want someone to say, show me. Will it be you? They're longing for it hurting, struggling. They just want someone to come alongside for a season in their life and say, follow me. I know where we're going. Do you hear the text? Join in imitating me. That's what Paul says. Not only that, it creates a cycle. You know, Paul, uh, they, they follow for a while, and then it's not long before they then start, they follow Paul, and then it's not long before they follow Christ. 
And there's this cycle where people might come for a period of time and they're learning and, and they're being, they're, you're guiding and you're protecting and you're watching over and, and then they find their footing and then they move on to, to, to what's most important, Christ. But for that, that time, you become the connecting piece so that they can grow. And then what they do is the, the, the parenting principle. Is where, where it, what do parents do? They teach, they guide, they instruct, they protect for a while so that the child grows and eventually they send them out into the world. I, I don't know if you were here last Sunday, graduation Sunday. That's exactly what that was. We've invested now for these two decades and we send you out. And eventually you'll do it for someone else. There's a cycle that's created. Let me give you an example of this from another person's life. St. Katia. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. She was born not, not too long ago. Uh, when, when she was born, there was all kind of uh, physical issues that, that were apparent right at birth. There were a number of she, facially disfigured. Uh, she never knew her father. Her mother gave up, to her, gave up on her because they lived in a society where, where physical disfigurements came with all types of stigmas. And so people knew right off the bat that this person, Katia, did not have a future at all. And so thankfully, the, the state stepped in and, and provided for her at least some level of care, but, but she was, was placed in a house where what the children struggled with were mental disabilities, not physical disabilities, because they saw physical and mental as being the same. And so just out of self-preservation, she, 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 she withdrew from everybody just to protect herself. Couldn't trust anyone. I mean, that's what she had learned from an early age. But there was a small group of people, just a handful of people, who saw something different inside of her. And they worked to get her transferred out of that home into a home that, was, that, that, uh, that she could move and to grow in. And they began to check on her. They began to, to pay attention to her. They began to, to write notes to her. They began to just to, to love her. They began also to work with her with some of the physical uh, disabilities and thankfully through a couple of surgeries, you couldn't tell any different. And along the way, they also told her about Jesus and, and, they, and they modeled that for her. And so she finally came to a point where she could love herself because they loved her and they loved her because Jesus loved them and loved her, and so she began to love herself and then and, and, and realized that she's worthy of love from other people and worthy of love from Jesus because she came to believe that he loved her deeply. And so she, she soaked up everything she could about Jesus. She was in church every time the doors opened, for lack of better, better words, she married herself at a young age to the church. When it was convenient, when it was not convenient, she ended up becoming one of the leaders inside of her church. She played in a praise band similar to what we have in our 9 o'clock service. And because she witnessed other people teaching and loving and caring, she followed them, and then it wasn't long before she started to love and to care and to teach others who were younger than her. They saw her as a rock star. I mean, after all, she played in a band. She began to tell her story about her life, about how a small group of people began to model things for her until she could stand on her own two feet. And something very interesting happened. Now, as a leader, she tells that story to those young people who now who sit under her for a season and they begin to think, well, if God can love her, then maybe God can love me as well. It's amazing how the cycle works. Saint Katia. You know she's a part of Saint Paul? Not here. In the Ukraine. She's about a junior in college now straight A student who sees her life 
as a means of a model to imitate what she's watched and heard and seen from you. Join in imitating me. That's what Paul says. It will change a life of someone else. But some of you will not because you are afraid. Surely the God that watches over you will see you through when you seek to be an example of faith to someone else. You can trust him that he'll see you through. Oh God, you know, we sang a song that had to deal with vision. So maybe what we need is an, a vision of what our life can be. What our individual life can be to the people around us. Not to promote ourselves, but just to be obedient, to be a servant. And even with our imperfections, to still be a model of forgiveness, of faith, of perseverance. I know what you really need is just someone who's willing. And you're waiting for that. So help us. Help us to have courage, to have boldness. To take this old way of living, imitation. And for a season in someone else's life to teach to guide, to protect, to love, and to care so they can walk on their own. Grant us boldness, we pray. And we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Our hymn of uh, consecration you'll find, it's hymn number 467, Trust and Obey. I want to invite you to stand as you're able. We're going to sing the first, the second, and the fourth stanzas of 467, Trust and Obey. <laughs>